Hello, and welcome to Banter, the official podcast of the American Enterprise Institute. I'm Phoebe Keller, the head of AEI's media department, and I'm here with AEI president Robert Doerr. We'll be your Banter co-hosts. Each week, we'll take you inside our think tank for conversations with leading policymakers and thinkers about today's pressing policy issues. Thanks for tuning in. Joining us today on Banter is Zach Cooper, who's a senior fellow with us at AEI, where he studies U.S. defense strategy in Asia, including alliance dynamics and U.S.-China competition. He also teaches at Princeton and co-hosts the Net Assessment podcast for War on the Rocks. Before joining us at AEI, he was with CSIS and the German Marshall Fund, and he's also worked at the National Security Council and Department of Defense. He's currently writing a book that explains how militaries change during power shifts. Thanks for joining us on Banter, Zach. Thanks, Phoebe. So good to be here. It's great to have Zach. You know, they've got a new book coming out along with his fellow AI scholars, Derek Scissors and Dan Blumenthal. The title is The New China Playbook. So let's just start off there. What's new in the new China playbook? (laughs) Well, I think we have a bit of a China attitude in Washington, but we don't have much of a playbook at the moment. So part of what we're trying to do is put forward some more specific ideas about going forward. What is it that the United States should be doing on China? And so Derek has laid out the economic case for why, although we talk about decoupling, it turns out that there's actually not been that much decoupling between the U.S. and China, and, and he's suggesting that we should decouple in some areas selectively. Dan and I are looking respectively at security issues and you know a little bit at the Taiwan Strait dynamics, which are critical. But I think the real focus for us is to try and put forward some specific ideas about what next set of American leaders could do to try and push forward a whole range of security and economic issues to stabilize the region. So let's just start with the decoupling for a minute, since I know you didn't write that section. It's more of a Derek thing. But from your standpoint, what more product or what economic hardship do you think we should bear in order to get our relationship with China correct? Well, it's it's almost you can think of two sides of the spectrum, right? So one is semiconductors, advanced semiconductors. Let's be honest, we probably should never have been buying that many from China in the first place. But I think at this point, we've got to be more careful in our relationship with the Chinese on semiconductors. And so I I think we're going to see investment restrictions going from the United States outbound into as well as the export controls that have been placed on Chinese companies that are operating in the United States and even on American companies operating in China. So so that's an easy one, right? These dual use systems that are both economically and militarily valuable. I think the harder choices are things that are less clearly dual use items. So I can tell you some that are not like kids toys, right? As you know, I, I have little kids. Yes. I, I like having cheap kids toys. I don't think it puts us at great risk to buy those from China. Or children's clothing. Or children's clothing, a, a, right. Many of the line. things bought at Walmart. Yeah, that's right. So, so I think for those things, that's fine. We're probably not going to decouple much in those areas. And I don't think it matters that much as long as we're not overly reliant on one market for really critical goods. Pharmaceuticals. Pharmaceuticals are an interesting one because the next two things on the Biden team's list, they've said, are biotechnology and pharma. And then the, the one after that is supposed to be green energy. And On both of those issues, you can make a little bit of a national security case, but it's certainly not anything as strong as what you see on semiconductors. I got it. I got it. Okay. So start with national security items and then, but you are supportive of building up toward other things because what will, what will, will it make China play more nice in the world, in the world of security? Will it make them back off on Taiwan? Is it a negotiating position Or is there something else about it? Well, I think there are a couple of logics. One is just to protect ourselves, right? I think it's pretty clear now that the Chinese economy is struggling a bit. And we don't have great transparency into what's going on in the Chinese economy because they tend to lie about most of the numbers that they're putting out there, economic numbers, demographic numbers. So we don't have as much information as we should. And so some of this is just self-protection in certain areas. But I think another aspect of it that's going to be critical is to make sure that we are not entirely dependent on China for key issues, like you mentioned pharmaceuticals, right? Right at the beginning of the pandemic, it wasn't just pharmaceuticals, but it was protective equipment, right? Other countries have seen China basically clamp down on the export of certain advanced elements that go into everything from batteries to semiconductors, right? We call these rare earth metals. So if we're really dependent on China for something, I think we have to be aware that the Chinese could cut it off, which means we need to be developing alternate supply chains for those. Things. Okay. Now let's talk about security. What, what should we do in Taiwan that we're not doing? 
Well, I, I think we've been talking a lot and then not doing much, actually. Mm -hmm. So the, the latest example of this is we had something called the Taiwan Policy Act that got a whole bunch of debate in Washington last year. Eventually, a version of it was appended to the National Defense Authorization Act last December, passed through the Congress. It was supposed to give basically $2 billion to, to Taiwan to focus on specific defense capabilities. And then there was an additional $1 billion of drawdown, drawdown authority each year. So about $3 billion. And what happens? Well, it got authorized in the Congress, but didn't get appropriated. And so once again, we've done the same thing we seem to always do on Taiwan, which is make big promises, get a whole bunch of effort, you know, some diplomatic pressure back from Beijing. And then at the end of the day, we don't see. And so what I'd like to see us do is actually follow through on the things that many of us have been talking about for years, which is, look, if we're going to authorize $3 billion of support yearly for Taiwan, we've, we've got to appropriate it. That just has to be a beginning point. So just to compare that failure to, to, to appropriate and spend an authorization of $3 billion <laughs> to what we're doing in Ukraine. So yeah. how many billions of dollars are going are being spent in Ukraine? I think we're, we're getting close to 80 at this in, in the planned spending on Ukraine. So I think this is a big disconnect, right? At the end of the day, the argument that many of us have been making for years is you need to invest some money now mm -hmm. to make sure that we bolster deterrence so we don't end up having to spend $80 billion or American lives to defend Taiwan. And yet you can't get it through the appropriations committees. It, you know, some of this blame, let's be honest, has to go back to the administration. Mm -hmm. They've made the case effectively on Ukraine. I just don't think they really engaged as much as they should have up on Capitol Hill for the Taiwan. But so just sticking with China and Taiwan, the, 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 switch, the switch on China and the commitment and the new energy to 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 counter China and support Taiwan is now five years old, at yep. least six, yep. seven years old. Are you saying that there's been no new weaponry, no new spending on security for Taiwan, despite all of that? It, there's been a bunch, but it's much less than you would think, right? I mean, I think it's probably an order of magnitude less than people would have, would have expected. Given and, the rhetoric. Yeah. yeah, and you have to remind yourself that, look, when we say we're going to sell something to Taiwan, it then takes a couple of years to actually deliver that. And, and right now, when supply chains are backlogged and the defense industrial capacity is pretty limited in the United States, it's even more than that. So when we approve an arms sale right now, it, it might be four or five years before that system gets to Taiwan. And given that we're pretty worried about a conflict happening in the next couple of years, that's just not good enough anymore. Mm -hmm. Wow. I thought I thought something had gotten a little better there, but apparently now what about you often write a lot about the other Asian potential allies to Taiwan in a, in a conflict with China, Japan. Are they doing significantly materially something different? Is Taiwan doing something yeah. materially different than, than they had in the last, say, seven or eight years ago? I think Japan has really stepped up. Mm -hmm. uh, when I first started working on Japan, one thing that everyone would tell you is that Japan was never going to spend more than 1% of its gross domestic product on defense. And they'd been sort of up at, I don't know, 1.07% last year. And now they say they're going to go to 2% in five years which would make Japan the third biggest spender on military equipment globally. This is a huge change. The third biggest spender on military yeah. equipment because their GDP is so big. Because their GDP is so big. So going uh -huh. up to 2% is a huge deal in Japan. And, and I think this probably hasn't gotten enough attention, in part because many people in the Japan community have said for years, well, Japan's just taking these small baby steps. But I, my view is that right now we're seeing Japan take big steps. And I think there are two reasons. One is they watched what happened in Ukraine and they're now pretty convinced that it's again possible for major wars to happen, including the great powers. Mm -hmm. And then I think the response to Nancy Pelosi's visit from China really scared them. You know, Beijing shot some missiles into Japan's exclusive economic zone. And so those two shocks, I think, have led the Japanese people to be far more worried and, and to really... Um, be willing to spend money to defend against this challenge. Now, what about the government of Taiwan? They, you know, there was an article in the paper today about the exporting of military all all over the world. People yeah. are trading military equipment, not just the United States. What is Taiwan doing? Taiwan is doing a lot. 
but probably not enough. So Taiwan still doesn't spend anywhere near 2% of its gross domestic product on defense, which remember is the threshold, it's the floor for what NATO allies are supposed to spend. Mm -hmm. But Taiwan is under much more severe threat than any NATO ally, and it's still not up at that spending level. So there are a lot of reasons for that. But I, I think part of what we need to do in Washington is find ways to convince people in Taiwan that they've got number one, to pay for their own defense with some support from us. But if they're not going to do this, then we're not going to be able to sustain political support to help Taiwan. So there is a lot that Taiwan is doing. President Tsai just mandated a new conscription and training regiment, which is real and politically difficult for her. But at the end of the day, there is a lot more that Taiwan needs to do. One final thought, though, is, look, when we make these big promises about $3 billion and then we don't actually come through with it, we lose a lot of our leverage over mm -hmm. what Taiwan is doing. And so that's that's a challenge moving forward. I'm curious how you think about there's kind of this divide that's opened up on the right that is very bullish on China, but then very wary on Ukraine. And I'm curious from your perspective, what? how would you respond to the argument that China's our top adversary and we need to focus more resources there rather than on Ukraine? I just think this is nonsense <laughs> I for a couple of reasons. One is we actually don't have U.S. troops fighting in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. So this would be a very different discussion if there were 10,000, 20,000, 50,000 American troops fighting bleeding in Ukraine. But the president chose not to do that. And so really what we're talking about here is whether the U.S. should continue to provide arms to Ukraine or not. Well, a couple of thoughts. One is the Ukraine war is mostly a ground war. And the war we would be fighting in Asia is not primarily a ground war. So much of what we're providing to Ukraine is actually not that critical for the China challenge. The second thing is, if we say that Russia and China are our two greatest adversaries and we are for pennies on the dollar able to dramatically weaken Russia, then I think that's probably a good use of money, mm -hmm. right? I mean, it's terrible for the Ukrainians that they've got to be the ones bearing the burden of this fight, but this has dramatically weakened the Russian military in a very short period of time. And then the third reason for me is just a basic one, which is, look, Ukraine is a democratic country getting invaded by a non-democratic country at this point. I think it's worth something to stand up for the rules-based order. And it's not just the U.S. doing this, right? Mm -hmm. Almost all of our European allies are with us. A bunch of our Asian allies and partners are with us too. And so I think this has actually had a unifying effect globally. So this argument that we shouldn't spend $1 anywhere outside the Taiwan Strait, I just don't think it holds water. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to go back to the pre related to your question, Phoebe, which mm -hmm. is the question of the day. And then we're going to get you to sort of well, we might even bring up Bridge Colby for a minute. But we won't <laughs> I, was gonna, that's, <laughs> I was paraphrasing him. But I want to go back to the the previous question about Taiwan. You you what you said was that the the Taiwan government, the Taiwanese government and the and the, and the leader there are not doing anywhere near enough. And that's another reason. I mean, in Ukraine, we have a, a, a people and a government and a leadership that is mm -hmm. that is fighting. And uh, all these folks that want us to do more in Taiwan, what do, uh, are they going to get Taiwan to do more? What, where's Taiwan? Why yeah. why is Taiwan do, not doing more? And are you does that make you worry about if there was a conflict about how aggressive they'd be in defending themselves? I do think there's reason to be a bit concerned. This isn't anything new in Taiwan, right? I, I think, look, as a quasi-academic, I think if you step back and you say, you've got You're two, not quasi-academic. You <laughs> are <an> academic. <laughs> if, if you've got two great powers standing off over a pretty, you know, small, you know, population, right? 23 million people. And, and the question is, well, who's going to really decide how this conflict goes? The primary actors are going to be China and the United States. Right. What they do matters more than Taiwan. And so I think sometimes it's hard to explain to Taiwanese that actually their investments make a huge difference. And so part of this is a public education campaign in Taiwan about why Taiwan's own investments matter. And the bottom line there for me is the real challenge the United States has isn't whether we can necessarily win, whatever that means, a Taiwan conflict. It's whether Taiwan can hold out long enough for the United States to come to its aid. Mm -hmm. And so Taiwan needs to invest now to be able to buy itself enough time that we can get there. 
right? Because if the Chinese go after our bases in uh, Guam and in Okinawa and they go after an aircraft carrier strike group, it might take us a couple of weeks to get together a sufficient force to fight back across to Taiwan. And the Taiwans need to be able to hold out that long. So some of this, I think, is just a public education campaign in Taiwan about why they've got to do more now to defend themselves so that we could even potentially get there to help them. So now let's just go back. Let's go into China for a minute. So Xi and his party had a conference, I think, in the last couple of days. Yep. Did, did anything happen there that was interesting to you that China watchers saw that is worth us getting out on the table now? Well, the, the big news is that China has set a 5%, roughly 5% growth rate target, which is higher than the last couple of years of growth have been, but significantly lower than anything that we used to see in China. So I, I think the, the big change here is China is acknowledging that growth levels are just going to be slower than they used to be. We'll see how American businesses that have been pretty used to making large profits in China feel feel about that as time goes on. My sense is that these slower growth rates are here and the Chinese leadership doesn't really know how to prompt much more rapid economic growth. And I think a lot of international businesses are then going to be asking, well, what's what's the logic of being in China if Chinese growth rates are basically the same as a lot of those mm-hmm. in Western countries? But there's a lot more political risk there. So that's been maybe the the biggest news so out of the NPC, as we call it. I read a piece over the weekend in preparation for seeing you about Xi, and they, they the author said he's a firm authoritarian Marxist, absolute authoritarian, excuse me, Leninist. Leninist, I was going to say. Firm yeah. and economics. He's not a capitalist. He's a Marxist, and he's using nationalism to motivate, keep himself in power. Yeah. I mean, it sounds like the of the three worst things you could be. Is that your reading of Chi? Is, yeah. is he as bad as all that? I think it's pretty clear that he's a Leninist and that what he's done is to try and put himself right at the center of the party, right? He, he literally has written himself into the party constitution. Mm-hmm. Why do you do that? You do that because you want to make sure that no one can throw you out of the party without threatening the party's hold on power itself. So in some ways, I think the biggest effect that he's had is to make the Chinese system much more brittle. Maybe not in the short term. In the short term, it's probably slightly stabilizing mm-hmm. because it's impossible now for anyone to challenge him. But, you know, in the fall, he had this party congress where many people expected he'd put a couple of his friends into senior positions. And what he did is he just wiped the table clean of all of the people that even conceivably could have been potential challengers. Mm-hmm. And and so I think what we're seeing now is, yes, he's Leninist, and he wants to be basically the heart of the party, like Mao Zedong. And the problem is going to be, like Mao Zedong, that when he's gone, when he leaves, there is going to be a giant fight. And it would threaten not just who's going to take over from Xi, but also what the whole system will look like. So I, I think he has made China a much more brittle environment. Do you see any signs of growing internal dissent? I mean, both the economic slowdown, but then also zero COVID, the protests, the relenting of that. Did that was that significant than the other things you've seen in watching China? There's so many things we don't know about this mm-hmm. question. I, I think it's pretty clear that there are many people in China who are quite unhappy with the direction that she is taking the country. Just take a look at the tech sector where he's cracking down on all of the most innovative people in China and, you know, they're voting with their feet, right? So if you go to Singapore, housing prices are way up. Why is this? It's because a lot of people have left China. You know, maybe they've left Hong Kong or maybe even Beijing and Shanghai and they're taking their money with them. They're taking their kids with them. They want to get out. So I think that tells you that there are a lot of people that are quite unhappy with the direction that she is going. Mm-hmm. But does that translate to anything that matters on the street for mm-hmm. for real opposition that has any effect? My guess is we're just not close to being there yet. Mm-hmm. And what Xi Jinping was able to do in the Party Congress last fall is a pretty good example that when when he wants to mobilize the state to crack down, he can do that. So that's where we are now. But I have to say look, we just don't have great data on this. And and so I think the confidence level that we have in making that assessment should be pretty low as well. Is the, is the, is the pull of nationalism really compelling to the Chinese people? Also with regard to Taiwan, the mainland Chinese people? I think it probably is. 
but again, I, I don't know. So there are people that try and poll in China, but there are lots of problems with that, as you yes. can imagine. Right. Now, I, I think we can look at other countries which have relied on nationalism in similar circumstances, and it, it can be effective. But it's a double-edged sword for Xi Jinping, right? It means that, let's say you try and make an attempt on Taiwan and it fails. Well, nationalism can go bad pretty quickly if you're in that situation. So I think the Communist Party is probably going to have to rely more on nationalism than it did in the last couple of decades when it could just show these dramatic growth numbers. Yes. But, but you know, that doesn't, that doesn't work forever. And so I, my guess is that the party is going to stoke a bit more nationalism that they, than they used to, but they also won't want to cross a line where they lose control of these dynamics. Do they, can they finally calibrate that? I, I don't know. Well, I want to ask about China in the world and particularly with regard to Germany. I have a sense of, I don't know why I have this thought that Germany is, has a potential to be more influential with the Chinese than that we realize because they have a big trading relationship. And, and does China care about what other countries in the world besides the United States say? You know, China does care. And I think one of the ways that we can affect Chinese decision making is to convince folks in Beijing that there's actually a penalty for them overstepping and crossing some line. It's not to say that they're going to react necessarily in the way that we would like, but I I do think that Communist Party leaders have a general sense when things are going against them, right? This is like an element of dialectic materialism that they, <laughs> yeah. they still sense. Yeah. And so there are countries that matter to them. Now, I think they tend to discount what they see as sort of small, unimportant countries. And sometimes Chinese experts and even officials will say this, and sometimes in reference to Europe, oh, these are small countries, they don't matter. But for whatever reason, I think the Chinese feel that Germany is a country that matters. Maybe it's, you know, historical, maybe it's because of Germany's manufacturing prowess, but pretty clearly the Chinese, they cared a lot when Olaf Scholz went to Beijing late last year. This was a top priority for them to make sure that this visit happened and then it went well. So I do think there are a handful of countries that have some leverage over China, whether they're willing to use it is, a, is another question. Well, do you think Germany is stepping up to that? I mean, Germany, if they could have influence on China, is it trying to have influence? I think Schultz is pretty, pretty skittish. We'll see. The, the Germans are supposed to release their version of an Indo-Pacific strategy sometime soon. I think it's going to be tougher than it certainly a, a strategy like that would have been a few years ago. But my sense is that Schultz has a lot of challenges internationally and domestically. And I just don't think picking a fight with China is is high on his list. So uh, I wouldn't it be good I mean, the United yeah. States to put a lot of pressure on Germany to do yeah. that. Well, and you know, Schultz was here I know. in Washington just a few days ago, and I I think that was probably a pretty substantial amount of the discussion that mm -hmm. that the president mm -hmm. was having with him. I I just don't have a good sense though whether it's enough to swing. German decision making. And frankly, we're pressing them so hard on Ukraine issues and on spending levels for defense that it, it may just not reach the, the level to push them over the edge. What do you make of the growing China-Russia relationship? How should we be prepared to respond if that was to become, if there was to, if we were to see an increase in support for Russia from China? I keep getting this one wrong. So uh, <laughs> I know, not you. I know. <laughs> Giving you another chance. <laughs> I, I keep thinking that the Chinese will wake up and realize that they're throwing their lot in with a declining Russia that is really damaging China's reputation globally, especially in Europe and in parts of Asia. And the Chinese just keep doubling down. Yeah. And, and I think the reason is that at the end of the day, um, Chinese really don't want to be isolated. They don't want to find themselves on the world stage with no friends. And Russia's got no other friends at the moment. Mm -hmm. So is China actually going to provide substantial weaponry to Russia? I doubt it because I think they're going to be worried about the blowback that they would suffer in that case. But again, I've been wrong on this one for just about a year. And I think a lot of Chinese experts have been wrong. Mm -hmm. Shortly after Ch Russia's invasion of Ukraine, Chinese experts and even government officials were rushing to folks in Washington and asking them what we all thought of China's support for Russia. And 
everyone in those meetings agreed that this was a terrible idea. It was going to backfire badly. And then Xi Jinping, again, just doubled down. Mm -hmm. So my sense is she has a close personal relationship with Putin. That probably is a big element, but I think this desire to avoid being isolated yeah. is... So they harder. avoid being isolated by sticking close to Russia. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, look, if you're in the UN Security Council and you don't want to have to veto things on your own, then yeah, yeah, yeah. better to have the yeah. Russians do it too, I guess. Okay. Two more before we go. And Zach, thank you for being here and thank you for this. This is not optimistic talk, not, <laughs> not, not, not cheery morning, let's go out and tackle the world talk. It's really it's really challenging china in the world but let's just ask a, you know what was going on with the balloon oh, gosh. <laughs> we let you get this far I, into the I episode know. <laughs> i know I, we'd, we'd almost made it yeah. Uh, yeah so here's my take on them is it not worthy to even discussing it no, are it you is. I, I think no it is We're i just, think the influx of media on this has been <laughs> overwhelming <laughs> i think the balloon has had a big effect on u.s china relations surprisingly. oh you do i do um before the balloon flight, Tony Blinken was supposed to go to Beijing. Yes, he was. It this was all was, scheduled. Yeah, this was sort of the beginning of an effort to stabilize the relationship that she and Biden had agreed to late last year. Right. And the Chinese were really excited about this. They felt like they were finally going to get a senior level meeting and maybe get something done. I think most of us were pretty skeptical about whether there was any progress that was going to be made. But the balloon flight, and I, I think the Chinese... I certainly don't think Xi Jinping approved this flight. I, I don't think it was an effort to undermine the Blinken visit. I think they probably just had no idea. You know, maybe this was an accident. It was supposed to go over Guam, but not the continental United States. Maybe they just lost control of it. But essentially, we had a very short window for the Biden team to try and, as they would say, stabilize the relationship. It was probably from, let's say, January or February of this year through, I don't know, July of this year. Because after that, we're going to be in election season and any move with China is just not going to be looked on well. Mm -hmm. So essentially what's now happened is they've pushed this Blinken visit back a couple of months. And all of the other visits, Janet Yellen was supposed to go to China. Mm -hmm. John Kerry was supposed to go to China. All those things are getting pushed back too. So they've basically shrunk by 50% the window for the stabilization efforts. So I, I think it's had a pretty substantial effect on the relationship. And the Chinese have responded terribly. So they, in my view, Biden misplayed this and she misplayed it. Biden misplayed it because they should have just shot the balloon down in Montana. Mm -hmm. And then he wouldn't have had three days of bad press and, you know, would have, that was a pretty easy yeah. answer, I think. Yeah. She misplayed it because rather than acknowledging that they'd made a mistake, they then embarked on all this disinformation about the balloon not being a spy balloon and then... Well, maybe it's a spy balloon, but the U.S. does this too, which we don't. So, you know, that damaged the relationship. And then the last thing is Xi Jinping then sent the vice foreign minister in China, who's going to be their ambassador here, to be the guy who is defending them against these balloon claims in Beijing. He didn't have to do that. But he sort of burned the one person who we seem to be building a little bit of rapport with. Mm -hmm. So I think the aftermath of the balloon just shows you how political everything is, both in Washington and Beijing, and how hard it's going to be to get the relationship on a more stable footing. Yeah. What, what, does, what is our best leverage with China? What, what do they want from us that we can either take away or give them that, that would, because you keep saying stabilize. So when you say stabilize, yeah. what do they get out of? What, 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 what is our best leverage with them? Probably economic. I, you know, Donald Trump wasn't wrong that we have a lot of economic leverage with China. Mm -hmm. We just didn't use it effectively. Yeah. And so I, I think if you're sitting in Beijing and you're Xi Jinping and you're thinking, how do I keep hold on power? The answer is, well, good economic growth numbers are pretty helpful. So the I, the news that Apple is going to build their biggest plan in India, that they, they don't like that. They truly yeah. don't like that. Yeah. I think that's a big concern for them. These export control rules that we're talking about, the outbound investment restrictions that are being debated on the Hill. I think these kinds of steps, those are things that the Chinese really worry about for good reason. And, and hurt them, that mm -hmm. cause them economic problems or... They could. Mm -hmm. But as you know well from, from Derek Scissor's research, I, I mean, this year we're basically at the highest U.S.-China trade deficit we've ever been. Yeah. So we talk a lot about decoupling. We yeah. talk a lot about the tariffs. But the end result right now is that the deficit's just about as high as it's ever been. 
And that's things we're buying from China. Yeah. Which is good for their economy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And some of it is, you know, money that's going in from American companies into areas that are clearly dual use areas that their military benefits from, which I think is the really problematic. Stuff. So in a way, the the other player in all this, and the Klon Kitchen AI scholar also yeah. likes to make this point, isn't the United States government or the Chinese government or the German government. It's It's the large multinational corporations that regardless of what the United States does, if they invest in China or if they buy products in China and sell them all over the world, they're China's get what they want without necessarily being friends with the United States. I think that's right. And as you know from I think you probably talk with, you know, chief investment officers at these places more yeah, than occasionally. I do. Yeah. <laughs> uh I think what really drives them, it's not what the Biden administration wants them to do. It's whether they think they're gonna make money in China. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and that's why the slowing growth in Beijing, I think, should be a real concern for the Chinese. Because at the end of the day, if you're Goldman mm -hmm. Sachs and J.P. Morgan or you know big private equity firms, and you're making decisions about whether to go deeper, Procter and Gamble is, is yeah, in that's right, China in a big way. Yeah, then then I think these these choices come back in part to whether you think you're going to make money and when whether your money and investments are safe in China. And if the answer on both counts is is no or that the level of risk is too high, then I, I think we'll start to see these companies change their behavior. Mm -hmm. So on all of these issues, Taiwan, China, Ukraine, what have you what have you not said that you'd want to make sure that our listeners knew about your your sense of what's going on in the world that is, is really like you're, you're it's driving your desire to get your message out? I think the the big lesson I would take away from watching what's happened in the last five or 10 years is the hardest thing in Washington is we have to make two different arguments. We have to make an argument to the American people about why they need to pay attention to China and why we have to resource that challenge. But we also have to make an argument internationally to our allies and partners, a lot of them in Asia, for whom China is their number one trading partner. And the thing I think we've struggled with the most is that those two arguments have to be slightly different. You can't motivate the American people to deal with the China challenge by saying, oh, we need to work more with our allies and partners. That just doesn't get them across the finish line. But you also can't go to the allies and partners and say, oh, the U.S. is in a strategic competition with China. We want you to do more. That doesn't motivate them. Mm -hmm. And so I think a lot of the work that not just I, but a lot of people here at AI are doing is trying to understand how can we build support domestically for the kinds of China policies that we need while also building support internationally for the kind of coalitions that we're going to need to push back against China on security issues and economic issues and technology and global governance. And I, I think that is a really, really hard problem and one that happily a lot of people here are thinking deeply about. But on the domestic one, I thought that the, the general view was that the there was a bipartisan consensus on China, that, that, that Americans have turned against China and want us to be tough on China. And what what do you think's missing from that that sort of is it is it the private sector behavior is it is it the willingness to sacrifice economically we can talk big but we won't make any real sacrifices with regard to our pocketbooks yeah I think what's missing is there's a bipartisan bipartisan concern about China yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't think there are bipartisan answers about mm -hmm. what to do going forward you you see this on issue after issue we talked about it with Taiwan you know. We've been talking about investment restrictions for years, and we, we haven't been able to put those together. So I think what's really happened in the last five years, as you said, is we've become much more attuned to the China challenge, but we haven't actually come up with a bipartisan approach and a clear strategy. And so that, that I think, is what's clearly the next step. So this feels to me like in, in the Cold War, in the early 1940s, we were sort of searching around for what our strategy was going to be, and we didn't find it for quite a while. I think we're in that same period now. The tariffs, the tariffs have stayed in place. That's that, true. That, that's a bipartisan action. Yeah. yeah, or lack of action and taking them off. Yes, or lack of action. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> yeah. Phoebe, anything more? I guess on the second piece, do you feel, to end on a positive note, yeah. because you focus so specifically on alliances, like, do you feel that the alliances that have been strengthened through the Ukraine process have been encouraging? Do you feel that if something were to come up with Taiwan or something else in that theater, that there would be kind of more goodwill and common goals to draw on because we've worked effectively with allies mostly in Europe? Or is that just a different set of alliances? No, I, I think it's really encouraging. If you'd asked a year ago, 
you know, or maybe yeah. a year, right. year and a month ago mm-hmm. and, and assumed that, you know, maybe the Ukrainian government was just going to fall. Right. And Europe was going to be divided and distracted. I, I think that was a pretty serious possibility. And the end result now is not only is Europe more united than it's been maybe in my lifetime, but NATO is expanding. Mm-hmm. Right. And it's hard to imagine Russia posing a serious military threat to NATO in the next five years, maybe even the next 10 years conventionally. So I think that is critical for the United States. And look, the, the Biden team, they're not perfect. But one area that they've made some progress recently is with key allies in Asia also. Right. So mm-hmm. a new basing agreement with the Philippines. We had a sort of landmark deal with Japan in January. We've got a new arrangement with Australia coming this month and probably some new arrangements with some of the Pacific Islanders later in the spring. That's some real progress. So I think if you look at Asia, if you look at Europe, we are making a lot of and and, you know, I think that has happened on a bipartisan basis with a lot of support from the Hill. And so I think part of our job is to keep that momentum going. Yeah, I I think, Zach, you may not agree with this, but I I think one of the aspects of the Russian invasion of Ukraine and China's belligerence and support for Russia that's happened domestically in the United States is the American left and young people and others that were often ambivalent Mm -hmm. about America's role in the world, about the idea that there were, you know, dangerous, bad players that were far worse than anything we would ever do. They've realized, hey, there are there are some bad actors and they do do terrible things and they're much worse than the United States. And that's kind of united the country in recognizing that we're a force for good in the world. Yeah, um, I completely agree. And I think that's been a, a positive byproduct of, mm-hmm. of this of this conflict. But it's it's I mean, where, you know, Zach, if I told you that you, the way you answered the question about Ukraine indicated that you thought that. We've had this amazing surprise, this amazing victory, this amazing degradation of the Russian military. You'd almost say Ukraine had won. Yeah. Has it? No. <laughs> I mean, no one really wins in war, right? right? But but at the end of the day, I think few people expected that we would be at the one-year mark of this war. And the Ukrainian government hasn't fallen. Kiev hasn't fallen. Right? And 100,000 Russian soldiers have been killed or yeah. casualties are huge. And I think that's due in large part to the bravery of the Ukrainian people, yes. the the tremendous mistakes of the Russian military, uh, and a lot of support from the United States and others. But is, it, is that a win? No. And and let's be honest, you know, I don't think we're going to see a clear Ukrainian victory here. I, I don't think the Ukrainians are going to get back hold of Crimea before this war ends. But at the end of the day, from just as a pure realist looking at this from from Washington. I think this is success from from the American perspective, right? Mm-hmm. Ukraine that is still largely free and democratic despite this Russian onslaught. That's that's a pretty remarkable accomplishment at the one year mark. All right. With that, we'll say goodbye and see you next time. Thanks, Zach. Thanks, Jimmy Robert. Hello, this is Jeff Pickering, Director of Academic Programs here at AEI and host of the Campus Exchange podcast. I want to take a moment to tell you about AEI's 2023 Summer Honors Program. This annual program is a unique, all-expenses-paid experience for undergraduates to study the pressing issues of our day with AEI scholars and other policy experts. This program will bring a couple hundred undergraduates from campuses across the nation and the world for week-long seminars taught throughout the month of June. Some of the courses we're offering this June will cover the changing nature of warfare taught by AEI's Corey Shockey, Polarization and Pluralism with David French of the New York Times, and the Foundations of Democratic Capitalism with AEI's Michael Strain. In addition to time in the seminars, students will also have opportunities to connect and network with other students, young professionals, and other experts across the political and policy spectrum. If you are a current college student or you know someone who may be interested, head on over to AEI.org or Google AEI Summer Honors to learn more and to apply. Applications are due March 15th. Thank you for listening. We hope you enjoyed the discussion today. Please remember to subscribe and rate the podcast. Feel free to send us any feedback or suggestions at banter at AEI.org.